Happy Friday and Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the first 2015 episode of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting January 5th, 2015. Before jumping into this week's episode, while shooting this, the U.S. is getting news of the recent two terrorist incidents happening in Paris that have to do with the earlier terrorist incident that left 12 people dead from a satirical newspaper in downtown Paris. Even though it has nothing to do with cybersecurity, we just wanted to share our heartfelt uh, moral support for any viewers that are in Paris or in France right now. Since I've been on holiday for two weeks, there's a ton of security news that I could cover. But to keep this episode small and quick, I'm just going to pick three stories I'm interested in. First, let's start with a big Sony update. We've been talking about Sony a lot, but a lot has happened in the past three weeks. First of all, some good news. Right around Christmas, Sony did release the interview on streaming services in the US. That means for about six bucks, you can watch and rent this movie. This, of course, is the movie that allegedly may be the reason attacker went after Sony. Now, as far as movie reviews are go, I did watch it. I can't necessarily recommend it. Some people will think it's funny and like it. Some people will probably hate it. But it's very nice to see the organization did not capitulate to a cyber terrorist demands. This is ultimately a good thing. In other Sony news, during the holidays, it seemed like North Korea's internet was inaccessible. Now, there's all kinds of different conjecture around this, whether it be a retaliatory attack by a government or something else, but it didn't last long and it's back now. Nonetheless, still interesting. In other Sony-related news, this week is CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. And during a Sony keynote, the CEO commented a little bit on the Sony attack. He didn't share much. He basically just uh, thanked his employees for standing strong against this attack and also comment on freedom of expression and speech. Uh, nonetheless, it was interesting to see him talk about it. Finally, we all know a while back the FBI officially blamed North Korea for this attack. Now, a lot of security experts have kind of gone against that, saying uh, the FBI doesn't have enough evidence or isn't showing enough evidence. During this week, the FBI again came out and the, the director of the FBI said they have a very high certainty that this is North Korean attack. They did talk a little bit about IP addresses. They said they did see these bad guys proxying a lot of their connections to hide where they were coming from. But apparently, according to the FBI, they made mistakes and they exposed uh, North Korean IP addresses as well. That said, there's still experts that are skeptical of this. An IP address does not make attribution. Nonetheless, I'm going to kind of side on the side of the FBI. I get there may be reasons that they can't share all the details they have, and the director of the FBI FBI does say they have more information. Many of the researchers pushing back against the FBI statements aren't really supplying evidence of their own, so it's all really kind of conjecture. But for now, I think uh, I'm going to go with the FBI's hypothesis. So that's probably most of the Sony updates. And by the way, while this story is probably going to continue, I've talked about Sony the last three episodes. So unless there's a lot of big information, I'm going to probably skip it the next couple weeks. Next up, let's talk Lizard Squad and DDoS, or Distributed Denial of Service Attacks. During the holidays, Lizard Squad actually lived up to their Twitter warning, and they took down both Xbox Live and the PlayStation PSN network during the holidays, during the busiest time of Christmas. So a lot of kids that got PlayStations and Xboxes uh, during the holidays may not have been able to play online, and in some cases for games like Destiny, may not been able to play at all. Now, I've talked about Lizard Squad DDoSs in the past. They are not all that interesting, but one of the differences this week is we now kind of know why they might have been doing these big public attacks. It seems like they might have been getting publicity for a tool they released this week called the Lizard Squad Stressor Tool. This is an online for hire service where you can go to a website, pay a certain amount of Bitcoin, and DDoS a target for a certain period of time. So this week Lizard Squad did release this tool, and it seems there might be a lot of 
activity associated with this tool. Uh, some Finnish panks suffered from some DDoS attacks. A, a internet image channel called 8chan went down because of these DDoS attacks. And on top of that, these Lizard Squad DDoSers went after Brian Krebs. They have a history with Brian Krebs, so they took down Krebs on security for a certain period of time. Finally, near the end of the week, Krebs wrote an article that went a little in depth on how Stressor works. And it turns out the Stressor tool may be taking advantage of a botnet that is at least in part made up of a lot of consumer routers or even some normal routers at universities and stuff. Uh, it seems like it's a Linux based botnet that's trying to log into both consumer and other routing devices using default credentials. And if it can do that and gain admin rights, it can install tools to scan for more routers. And it can then use those routers as bots in its big distributed denial of service attack. So it's quite interesting. As an aside, DDoSing services are not abnormal. They've been around for a long time, but they certainly are picking up quite a bit in activity. And there's many different types of DDoS attacks. A lot of the ones used by Lizard Squad seem to be basic ICMP and SIN flood, uh, according to many of the people that have suffered from them. But there's volumetric attacks, there's amplification attacks through different protocols calls and many other things. Long story short, you might consider thinking about how you might protect your organization from DDoS attacks as they're probably going to continue to grow in the future. For my last story, I was going to talk about a new vulnerability affecting Mac OS X computers called Thunderstrike. And this was a flaw that a researcher found that takes advantage of the way Thunderbolt works. It's a proprietary device interface used by Apple. Essentially, a malicious Thunderbolt device can actually inject uh, some malicious code in a certain part of, of your computer's firmware. And this could actually allow the malicious code to take over parts of your boot sequence and it turns into kind of a bootkit type malware. So it's a pretty serious vulnerability for OS X computers except for the fact that it can only be leveraged physically when you plug in a Thunderbolt device. So that was what I was going to talk about in detail but instead I'm going to put a link to that in the reference section because I learned some late breaking news that I think it's kind of important to discuss and that's a big change to the way Microsoft Patch Day is going to happen. According to some news stories there's going to be some job cuts at Microsoft's trustworthy computing division. And this was the division that Bill Gates started in 2002 to improve Microsoft's uh, computer and software security. And I really like TWC or trustworthy computing. Back when I first started in security, Microsoft was really bad at it. They were actually a very good example of non-transparency and bad security practices and bad coding practices. But after after launching TWC, Microsoft became changing. And lately, I actually believe Microsoft is a great example of how software companies can approach security and create secure code. However, Microsoft now has a new CEO, and Microsoft does seem to be losing a little bit of market share in the operating system world. So you might understand why they might remove their focus from uh, TWC and reinvest somewhere else. But I'm kind of concerned by them removing TWC. Besides just the job cuts, it seems like notification on patch day is going to change except for premium customers. We may not get the patch day notifications. There's a blog post talking about it, and pretty much they say because everyone's auto-updating, we don't really need to uh, release bulletins. But that kind of means that Microsoft is going to go back to the place where you, know, you will have to search on your own to find details about vulnerabilities. While many people are okay with automatic patching on client computers, servers are a different story. Anytime you're going to interrupt a production server, you want to know about the severity of the update and how important it is to move fast so that you can gauge if it's worth the business downtime. In any case, I don't really know how patch day is going to change. We may not be getting the normal notification we've got in the past. I don't know if this in the long term will affect Microsoft security. Will they retain as good a security focus as they've had in the past? But I can say I'm a little concerned. 
You know, while I get that Microsoft needs to focus on building their business, I really thought TWC was a good thing. Uh, so we'll see what happens from this. So the takeaway from Microsoft administrators is to pay attention to the next few Patch Tuesdays. We'll see if they do release notifications, but if they don't, you know, you may have to find other mechanisms, including hopefully WatchGuard's blog, to learn about these patches and maybe gauge whether or not you need to move quickly or you can wait a little bit when applying them. So that's it for the first episode of the New Year's. I hope you enjoyed it. And as happens every week, there's a ton of other interesting security stories. For instance, a big Bitcoin provider got hacked this week, plus all the stories I missed from the past few weeks. So be sure to check the reference section to the blog post associated with this video. Now, usually you can find that at blog.watchguard.com. One show note for this episode, when I post this to YouTube this week, our blog is going to be down for maintenance. We'll probably uh, put it back up next week, but you may not find the blog post for this video till next week. So if you're interested in the references, I'll be sure to put them into the information on the YouTube video as well. Besides following and subscribing to us at blog.watchguard.com, you can also follow us on Twitter, I'm SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Now, one final show note. Over the next a few weeks, I'm going to do an experiment. Uh, rather than just posting the Friday video, every day I'm going to try to post a 60-second video highlighting some sort of story or security news every single day. And this would be very, very short, 60 seconds. As a result, it may change the Friday video as well. Instead, on Friday, when I create the summary, I might mash these together and maybe add a little extra detail to them. But watch for me changing the way I do videos over the next couple weeks. And if you have any opinions on any of these changes, be sure to let us know either on Twitter or in the comments of the blog or wherever you want to, to talk to us. That said, as always, thank you for watching. And here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.